Yeah, yeah. I knew that was the right crowd to do this too. <laughs> do you got any good jokes? This right, might be it. fun. That's yeah. Uh, oh, oh, what do you call a bear with no teeth? Gummy bear. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is my single joke I know, my go-to, my favorite. Good Glad work. you had it. Yeah. It's one of my, yeah, I love that one. <laughs> so wholesome. So wholesome. That and math jokes, man. I don't know any now. Do you have I, a joke, Aline? Do you want to do one? Oh, yes, you can't. You can't talk too loud. I'll hear you. Oh, wonderful. We're live now. We're live. Okay. Okay, once the tweet goes live, we all retweet it. Yeah, exactly. Do you want the address? It, we'll just take it from your Holberton School handle. Okay. Who's tweeting? Are you going to tweet it? Perfect. So we're going to get that tweet started so that we Jack can all owes retweet us one. Everyone uh, to get owes more us. viewers. Yeah, we're on Facebook Live right now, hence our streaming. So um, I'm just going to get us started here. So we got, let's see, hello. Uh, welcome to Holberton School's Fireside Chat. Our guest this evening is Patricia Dugan. Uh, Ms. Dugan is the founder of It's the Community Consultancy, Community Networking and Events, which assists enterprise companies and startups to optimize their use of marketing as well as community and event productions, such as meetups, hackathons, and conferences. Uh, she is a self-proclaimed yogi and fitness nut, but what has struck me the most is her ability and eagerness to reach out to others and to share ideas. I originally uh, met her via Twitter when she asked a question about the Docker Holberton ha hackathon that we had last week here. Um, I replied and was su pleasantly surprised that she wondered if I would be here, if we could trade emails, take a selfie, um, so she's very approachable. <laughs> um, I, I don't know her well, uh, but her tweets are top notch. I suggest following her at Patricia underscore Dugan. Um, and I know you're all excited to get to meet her and her work, so I'm going to hand it over to our interviewers, uh, Larry Medeo and Katia Kalash. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome, Patricia. And I guess since we talked so much about Twitter before we uh, dive in into your work and what you do, yeah. uh, what do you think? How, how do you think personal branding and online presence affect uh, your career and mm -hmm. job search? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, before you get started, is it time? Okay, are we? Okay, we're retweeting. We are I'm so sorry. Okay. So sorry. <laughs> that's the key Interrupting the in interviewer <laughs> is bad for your brand, but I did it. Okay, we're in. That's a great question. Um, I think it's very important. I also think authenticity is very important, um, and I think very strongly. I feel very strongly that you can't control how people feel about you no matter what you do with your branding. Um, there will be people who spin things, you know what I'm saying, that, so you just do the best you can to be your own true self. Um, and it is important to, to create angles which shine so people know what you're about. Otherwise, especially in Silicon Valley, sometimes you get, you get no time, really, to, to tell people what you are. Um, so you really have to be, be able to say, like, this is what I do, um, this is how I do it, and uh, show that through branding. And sometimes it can be confusing because I am, um, as she said, you know, a, a very outgoing person. And oftentimes, especially for females, when you are that way, people don't take you as seriously. So you really have to know your own true self, my personal feeling, and just go for it. Yeah. All right. Do you think it's better to keep it more on the professional level or kind of share some private life with your followers? And how uh, to balance it, I guess. On Twitter, yeah. Yeah. specifically, okay. or in, uh, in your brand. Um, well, you know Bren Brown. Do you know who Bren Brown is? Anyone here know who Bren Brown is? OK, well, you need to, I, I highly recommend you learn who she is. She is a social scientist, absolutely. Huh? Brene. Brene. Or, or Brene. Brene, what do I call I her? Know. Or yeah, Brene. Brene. Maybe it's different ways to pronounce it. Yeah, she's from Texas. Maybe, maybe I'm <laughs> Californiaizing it. Um, yeah, Brene Brown, she's known for speaking about vulnerability and being able to be that way. And um, very, very smart, very popular. Um, and then there's the thing that you don't want to bring all your tears to work, right? So I feel like 
I feel like we wouldn't have bonded if I were not my true self. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like, you know, my afternoon today going to Sephora and whatnot, I mean, I know these people's stories already, you know, like it wouldn't happen if I didn't have an open heart. But at the same time, this is, you know, The Art of War is one of the most read books for a reason mm -hmm. because it's not all unicorns and happy little rainbows and shining stars, right? Like, I think you have to really know when you're opening the gates and know at what point, if they crush my soul, if someone, a human person, crushes my soul over me being authentic or me sharing, am I okay with that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's your own personal choice, but it is something to think about before you do it. Because I've, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter say a lot of stuff. I myself have shared, overshared at times. Um, and, uh, you know, as someone um, well-known in the industry told me once, he said, the, the internet lives forever. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, maybe, uh, do you mind talking a little bit about your company and what is your like, daily routine looks like at work? Sure. Well, my company was started out of, um, a need in the marketplace in San Francisco uh, because the industry is very saturated, it's pretty hardcore, it's a lot of people and a lot of people who've known each other a very long time um, and that they hire from that pool as much as you know we do have websites where you go apply. I don't know how it actually works but I do know when I got into the marketplace I started at Samsung um, so I did go the traditional route, but I've also had a lot of bumps and curves and twists and loss and gains. And my only way to have a safe haven was to create my own little thing where I could go like, here's my backpack and this is what I have in it to offer you. Yeah. Uh, so as far as what's in your backpack uh, I'm curious to know more about the uh, what you uh, what services your company provides and, and who uh, your customers have been or what kind of sure. customers you've had cool um, well my the services I provide are mainly developer marketing this is really my skill set is developer relations developer marketing um, community building and as you know, or if you don't know, community building is really a pretty new thing and oftentimes it needs an engineering background, which I don't have. Um, so I really focus on the developer relations, developer marketing part of it, but my, my natural uh, lean is towards organizational strategy and behavior. So that's where the community building comes in. My clients have been uh, SDX Central, which is one of the first um, digital publications that was really focused on software-defined networking. Uh, the New Stack, which a lot of people know. Um, so digital publishing in tech. Um, Nuage Networks, owned by Nokia. Who else? I mean, sometimes, sometimes when I go work somewhere, I go so far in, like I'm super passionate, that by the time I'm done with that, I can't even remember I worked anywhere before that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any smaller company you work for? Well, SDN Central was small. The new stack's very small. Um, who else did I work for? Yeah, I mean, Walmart Labs is not small. That's the opposite of small. Walmart is the biggest. Um, yeah, so a lot of startups along the way. And I love, I have to tell you, I love startups. Yeah. I love. I love startups. Like seriously, if I had a bunch of money, I would just like build companies and just do community. that for fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. So is that the strategy is really different when you're trying to build a community for a small company or a large one like, like Walmart? Yeah, um, I believe so because there's two words that come to mind, culture, and strategy. And have you worked in a large company before, like an enterprise company? Uh, how, how, how many people have? No one? A couple? A few? I mean like large, right? The game changes. It's, it's, it's 
a mass of human beings with generally kind of antiquated software and mm -hmm. you know and then each idea takes forever you know what I'm saying and a small let's see we we're talking um, the difference between open source so for a small company open source you can just have a quick powwow and know what you're doing right and also you don't small companies don't tend to populate with people who aren't really focused on one vision so it's not confusing right it's like us three Let's build an open source community. It's going to take us two minutes to hash out whether we're going for Node.js or doc, you know, or container ecosystem or whatever, right? But at somewhere that's larger, it's going to be like, we know we need to do open source. Sorry, big companies, but this is true. It takes a long time for the actual vision to get distilled, you know. Somewhere someone in a big company is like, yeah. burn her. No. <laughs> um, so apparently it doesn't really, uh, you're prepared to work with a large company or, or small company because I had thought that maybe that uh, a company had to have a certain amount of business before they could justify hiring someone to, to manage, say, their open source community or the community around their software products. So is the question, what does validate that spend? Um, I, I would, I or we can yeah, just yeah, play we can with, work it. with it. Let's play yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, what, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, I think that's an interesting, you know, puddle of thoughts there. Um, because I, I actually think about it a lot. Um, because small company, it's small company, big company, value matters. Um, you just feel it more when you have less money, the pain, when you lose it. Um, I think that one has to know, and I believe this in life in general, that you have to know your intention. You have to know why you're doing something to win at it. So if all you know is we need to build an open source community because you heard it from your buddies around the valley, you know, then you're going to hire someone and likely take the cheaper option, someone who may have a couple of notches on their belt doing open source. Um, you're not really knowing why. You're not really knowing what you're going for. Um, I think that I personally if it were my company, wouldn't make a move until I understood it. And I, I'm a research, you know, um, person. So like, I would talk to all my friends, I would do the research first and, and understand it myself before just saying, oh, we're gonna hire someone for open source. I mean, you have to know, like, do we want user acquisition? Do we want, um, are we, do we want to share what our technology is? Do we want brand awareness? Do we want hiring? Um, and all of those variables matter. And all of those variables actually will define how much you want to spend. Because I can say from my personal experience, I know that my career path, you know, you, you level up, level up, level up. And then all of a sudden, you're not the cheapest one on the block anymore. You're not, you know, um, and you're not the most expensive. And so there's this very specific bubble. And what I've seen is like, so do you want to hire someone who can fast track you to the right audiences, or do you want to hire someone for cheaper who can do a few meetups? You know, it's all about really what you want. And then, uh, as far as open source communities, uh, can you think of uh, particular examples of uh, open source communities that exhibit best practices? Let's define best practices first. Does anyone have, I would love to hear from you, does anyone have what you think is a best, I know you use GitHub, so you're in open source, <laughs> right? So what, what does best practice open source, what do you like when, what do you like in open? Uh, well, I personally like being able to see other people's thought processes, but mm -hmm. in an organized manner that is easy to understand. And that's where the, that standardization comes into place. Okay. And do you see that from PRs, or where do you observe your, where do you observe your most communications right now? Most communications? Well, where do you observe this? Like, 
Oh, mostly here within our own code oh, and okay. other students. Okay. But you can also look. It's it's funny because like if you look at other people's codes on GitHub, for example. Um, or we just worked with Docker containers yeah. uh, during the Docker yeah. Hackathon, and you can tell, you you can no, you can tell right off the bat what's what's better or not, like b yeah. better uh, practice, maybe not best practice, because yeah. um, I don't know best practice yet, but I can tell if something's following some sort of reasonable yeah. standardization yeah. versus if someone just making something up as they go or not yeah. documenting it well. Yeah, you know, and this goes back to what we were saying about Twitter is that. I mean, especially in open, we're new. Like, we go so fast these days that we think things are old, but really, in the grand scheme of things, open is very new, it, kind of, sort of. Some, someone out there who is in tech in the 80s is like, it's not that new. <laughs> but I mean, you know what I'm saying? This is new, so that's, that's great. Um, anyone else? I guess, I guess, from my perspective, I'm mostly a consumer of open source products. So um, I think, like, isn't Firefox? There, I think there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of companies out there, but um, I'm mostly a consumer, so yeah. I don't really know about the how, what's happening on the back end. Like yeah. your job, I have no idea like what you would have been doing um, in the background or um, how an open source uh, company is able to make money. For example, yeah. I don't know how that works. Yeah, and I think a lot of us are kind of new in that area. We know that we can contribute to uh, an open source project, mm -hmm. but I don't think any of us have actually done that yet yeah. and really been yeah. a part of that. Yeah. So I, I think everything about best practice or anything about that topic is all, I think, new so for I most of us. So I should just totally lie to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. No, no, we, we're not asking for that. I, I, I guess, well, here's an example I of something. I have answers. I just, Well, yeah, I, yeah. I believe you do. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, yeah. uh, just but to answer your question about yeah. something that strikes, one thing that strikes yeah. me as a best practice is, say I'm going to use this open source software. Yeah. They're helping me if they have good documentation and I like things that are that are bolded, and I and I I don't like bad grammar. Yeah. And, it's just, <laughs> and and so when I see something that's presented well, I I that they're telling me yeah. that they care Quality. about me and 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 my ability to easily use that product. Yeah. And, and so that's 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 just one thing that comes to my mind. That's beautiful. That's you know end user quality assurance and end user, like user experience, actually caring. Um, I love, love that feedback. Because um, I, I spend, I think anyone who's into quality notices like that you spend extra time that no one cares about, right? And then sometimes uh, you go like, why are all these people walking around being mediocre? I just don't get that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice, nice to know that falls somewhere. Um, Best practice, you know, I think that's up for deliberation, um, but I think it does come down to uh, caring and solid process and a cohesive vision, get the DevOps name in, but a cohesive vision across all the people in the community and leadership. When you have leadership who does not understand the community, there's a problem there. So I wonder, um, say that if you're working in a large organization, perhaps I'm, I just wonder if one of your roles might be to really be um, an advocate for the, the the community users to where perhaps people in leadership might not have as much of a sense as you do because you you spend time with community members yeah. and, 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 and kind of distilling your experience. Yeah, that's where the whole developer relations role comes from and, and the, the advocate for open source or for developers is to really, you know, not everyone can do it. I was, I was talking to a thought leader in the space who I will name if you end up asking that question later. Um, I was telling her, you know, that imposter syndrome hits here and there and she said, you know, Sometimes it's not something everyone can do to go into groups of people and really meld with them and then be able to gather that 
need or those thoughts and turn around to an entirely different group of people, namely leadership, and transpose those needs and, and stuff to them, right? It's like that, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a, a critical role and I'm not the only one who does it. Um, and, uh, and when done well, I think it's changing the way the industry is absolutely going to end up, you know, for the long term. Am I fired already? <laughs> this isn't The Apprentice. <laughs> we also know you have some uh, experience in organizing vi virtual meetups yeah. and hackathons. Yeah. So I'm very curious, how is it different from offline ones? And uh, like, I don't know which one are more successful. Mm. So <clears throat> when I worked at SDN Central, which is now SDX Central, um, but I can't call it SDX Central because I like grew it as SDN Central, I was the producer for something called the Demo Friday programs. Demo Fridays were high price to us, low price to big business, um, webinars held by very, you know, um, established companies in the industry and what they do they were an hour webinar and you get a thought leader comes in and then we talk about the technology and then I would manage that whole thing which meant dealing with the talent and doing all the promotions and uh, what was the question again where am I going with this yeah. oh online versus okay so so that was totally online um, versus in person oh well, are we talking what is the value or how are they different? What is the value? I think that the value is in both of them, but I think that the value in meetups gets lost often because um, oftentimes they're quick and or have very low budget, so we don't record them and we don't promote them and we don't get to live stream them for global audiences. So as... Um Many of us are new to the, the industry. We're you know, here to try to get started. So I was wondering if you could think about our shoes and we're trying to get into the tech industry as engineers, can you think of any advice uh, about uh, what, like how to start or um, what, what kind of companies to look for? Just any kind of, exp uh, from your perspective, uh, not necessarily as an engineer, but just knowing the yeah. industry. Yeah. That's a good question, I appreciate you asking it. And one of the main reasons I appreciate you asking it is, <clears throat> there's a lot about me that um, gives me a perspective that has the right to answer this that can help you. Um, one, of, one of these reasons is because I was a reentry student who graduated in 2011. I used to be a professional cook and a certified sommelier. That was my big dream and then <laughs> and then by the nature of the universe, you know, things changed. And I always had a good head on my shoulders, a thinker. And I ended up, um, this is a long story, so I'll shorten it, I abbreviate it. I went back to school um, and, and got my degree. And um, I dreamt of Silicon Valley. And I remember the first day driving in to my interview at Samsung, one of like what felt like 20, but it was only three. Um, I remember thinking of the valley like, you know, um, Dorothy, you know, the Yellow Brick Road. And I was sitting in traffic, right, for hours. And I was like, this is not the Emerald City. Like, this is like, sucks. <laughs> but, um, but long story short, you know, fast forward, that was 2012, you know, going on 2000, December 2011, to here we are, you know, and time flies. And I've worked for several companies, big and small. I've met a million people. I now have a network that I didn't even know what network meant back then, you know what I'm saying? Um, I've learned so much about not just the culture, but about 
the types of people in the industry, how to get work in the industry, the type of stamina you need to get work in the industry. Um, one thing I would say off the bat is make business cards. I don't care if you, if you don't even know what you do yet. I mean, you know what I'm saying? If you have a small inkling of what you do, make a cheap ass business card with your name on it and you, I don't put my number on mine because my first veil of privacy is my number and so if you want to get to know me, you get to know me a little. But it, put your email, whatever. I mean, literally, I, I can tell you I met like a head guy at UCSF in an elevator. I was going to work in the lobby somewhere. Literally, we were talking for maybe under a minute. And he's still in my network. I mean, I have still, you know, made connections, you know, hung out, whatever. But it was because I had something to give. And I would say that to, to anyone of any age when you're in San Francisco or New York. But I would say San Francisco, just have a card. Rule numero uno. <laughs> uh, any other advice for these, uh, are these developing uh, software developers that we are? Yeah, for starters, be really proud of yourself. I, I think, you know, I was telling a, a professor of a very, very, very good university the other day um, how proud she should be that she has her, you know, she's a doctor, right? How proud she should be of that because I watch um, Grey's Anatomy. I've learned many of my life's lessons from Meredith Grey's mother, Ellen, or what's her name? Uh, I keep forgetting because she's not in there anymore. But she used to tell Meredith Grey, the carousel keeps spinning, which means that the work keeps coming, the problems keep coming, the hardships, the great things. And, you, and it's so much easier to remember the wounds than the positives. Um, so that's one thing I believe in is to keep coming back to remember the things you're proud of and the hard work you do. Because um, speaking personally, this industry you're choosing it's the most fascinating, it's a freaking love affair, <laughs> but it is the one with the biggest fangs. It's, it's the chief kahuna, um, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's really important to like know inside yourself you know, what you're doing. And I don't think anyone, if you brought in any fancy pants entrepreneur into here who's made billions, they would probably sit right by me and prob maybe say the same thing. Um, yeah, so, so remember what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, other tips of the, of the trade, stamina, <laughs> freaking stamina, right? Because, um, I mean, you might get lucky, but even if you get lucky once and your friend gives you a job or your friend's friend gives you a job, eventually you'll end up looking for a job again. I promise you this. Um, and I think, you know, I know for a fact I'm emotion an emotional person, but that's what makes me special and be able to connect with people quickly. But like we're all emotional people and loss of work, whether it's positive or negative, can kick you in the face. And you have to, they say keep your chin up for a reason. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's very important. I do. All right, well those are a couple good tips. Um, I know that you are going to be participating in a, um, uh, conference and doing and participating in a discussion about uh, women in tech and practical strategies. Yeah. Uh, maybe you'd like to practice a little bit of your presentation <laughs> on, on, on this uh, diverse, uh, our, our diverse student body. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's so funny. I, I am, you know, one of those like top perform overachiever people. And the conference is in May, it's Interop ITX. And I've been rally, you know, very lucky to have a cool panel. And people are like, oh, don't worry about it. It's in May. And I'm like, no, yeah, we got to start now. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to say, truthfully. But one thing I have to say is that there are women nowadays who you can approach for a panel. And I actually had someone respond to my email and said, do you know what I do? And I said, yes. And it was her way of saying, I'm not here to be a woman on a panel. I am a top, you know. And so I think um, there's a real challenge in game right now. If you look, if you Google Tumblr all white male panels, 
you'll find a Tumblr on all white male panels, and if you do one, you'll get thrown up there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you how I found out, because I was throwing a panel, and I, I tried to find a woman female engineer, and I couldn't find someone. And someone DM'd me on Twitter, a woman known in the space, and she, I thought she was going to kill me. She, well, no, it wasn't that bad, but she was really like, how could you? Like, how could you? And she told me about that Tumblr. But so what I'm seeing now, though, because when I'm on the front end asking women, is that we need women in panels, but women are also like, that's really not what I'm here to do, is be the female on a panel, right? So it's, it's really a crux, and also with the latest Yes, the latest, uh, it, I don't want to call it a scandal because it devalues what is actually the latest honest exposition of what has been happening in the industry over so many years. Uh, wow, I, 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 um, I actually was telling someone who wouldn't care because she's not in tech, I was saying I've been waking up to a big thought bubble, like as soon as I wake up my thought bubble is just right there. Um, but what I'm getting at is like, we're bringing everyone in, you know, we're going young women, uh, women, diversity, diversity, but what are the actual tools of the trade now, right? Like, what are we, what, how are we gonna arm ourselves? Not just women, men, everyone. Because at the end of the day, that whole shtick is groupthink, which means group people need to learn how to break that, right? Because they've done studies, right? If one person's dying and the whole group ignores it, everyone will ignore it. That's not cool. Oh, that um, excited uh, a question yeah. from me. So <laughs> without, you know, I understand protecting confidentiality is very important, but I was wondering, is there a time where you feel that you've had to stand up for yourself as a, a female in the industry, and how did that go? Because I'm, I'm thinking that's probably going to be happening in the future for many mm. people here and I was just curious how you ha how you handled it or how things went it's a very good good question hot seat game face no <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean there are some things that so there's some things I, I I don't know even how to process because I came up so young and sometimes for me personally it was like not knowing your rights, not knowing what you'll do if you lose a job. One thing that's been on Twitter people are saying is when you're not established you don't feel strong enough to speak out because you need the work. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking a lot about this the past couple of days like if you have parent, if you're young enough to have your parents really having your back, I mean, I almost would say to younger, not just, I don't think it's just women who deal with harassment, mm -hmm. to say like, you know, mom and dad, like this is a, you know, tough gig out here sometimes, and will you have my back if I stand up for myself because I'll, I may or may not get fired, you know. Um, and I, this is a very jello thought that I just started having the past 24 hours, so I don't know how I feel about that. But I'm saying, your question is, your question, I'm answering it very vaguely, which is because I didn't have anyone, and so I have seen and put up with a lot. And so how I dealt with it was not the way I would deal with it now. But even now, sometimes things are hard and interesting and vague and convoluted and you sometimes go at what point you know it's just at you know you at what point is it not everything's perfect at what point do is this a hostile environment at what point you start trying to figure out figure that out and uh and I know that there are advantages to having a diverse workplace, uh, and I'm, I'm just hoping that you can tell us a, about that, you know, perhaps from your experience or uh, any research you'd be familiar with, anything like that. 
Yeah. Back to the panel, I wanted to point out that I'm deliberately going to craft the framework with the five panelists to talk about our skill set mm -hmm. in relationship to getting ahead. Because I want to like make sure that it validates this is not about being a woman, <laughs> right? And, or a man, or you know, uh, any you know, ethnicity or whatnot. Um, the value. So I should do, I wish I had done more research now that you're asking me, but I know for a fact there are studies that show that teams with more women on them do better. They, create, they make more money, they create more value. Why, why wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, why wouldn't they? Uh, women, how are women different than men? Like, can we name like three things? Appropriate things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good question. Let's do things, let's do things in, in like accordance to this bubble, which is um, things that might bring value to a group, to a, to a business group. Well, I'm, I'm only thinking of things that are like both, like having a family can, can be an advantage. Like I think of it as a woman because I am a woman, yeah. and that's something that I want in the future, but like that's, you know, for men and women that could be a positive trait. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of a uh, tendency that many women have is that they tend to think in very relational terms. Mm -hmm. And so I think oftentimes when they approach problems, they may not necessarily or imperatively have the focus on a specific issues, their male counterparts, but they do take into consideration a lot of other global details and proximity to it. And so I think by having that partnership between the two, you're able to kind of hit a lot of angles with the yeah. issue. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts back there? You fun look oh you came back. These are my Docker peeps. Well I ran I think <laughs> didn't I run into you in the in the hallway? Oh, <laughs> probably maybe I don't know. All of ev everyone, this row here. <laughs> <laughs> Would be surprised. Um, yeah, yeah. We're still in a crash mode from our Docker. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I feel that I'm not in a, a place to comment on, on this topic. We have comments. Well, I think maybe one difference is like our society has kind of socialized. Um, Men, I don't know, like maybe men are socialized to be more domineering and like mm -hmm. ver verbose and mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. like trying to take control of things. Yeah. I don't know, this is just off yeah. the top of my head. No, you're actually right. I saw an article uh, yesterday that was saying, you know, men are more competitive. And then it was countering it with women tend to compete with themselves more and the men compete with others. Um, and I've seen even in my own character over the years that um, you know, you don't go on the football field wearing your ballerina slippers, right? So I've seen me over the years as someone who's an artist and used to dance a lot and all this become more tough, um, more like, you know, I don't want to say more manly, but <laughs> but you know, like more tough. And I know it's an adaptation to be working in all male cultures. Um, was maybe that was my therapy to you, but <laughs> from you. But I think you were saying, yeah, that that, and not all men. This is a thing. This is why I think we need to really break down these walls because not all men are like that. And then the men who are not like that feel feel uncomfortable or like they have to be like that. And then the men who are like that tend to get the room, and we all know that. Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, in my experience here, I just feel like our job is to create ideas, and, and we share ideas, yeah. and we build better ideas by collaborating, and so that's just 100% uh, just pure communication, and, yeah. and I think that I, you know, uh, women are reputed to be better at that, uh, and I think my observation shows that to be true, but I just feel like 
um, but also just diversity across any measurable spectrum leads to diversity of ideas yes. to have a bigger basket of ideas yeah. to choose from. Yeah. And if we're all even keel, we, we, we admire a good idea for its merits and not who yeah. it came from. And then the team does well based on Yeah, that. which is I think then it comes back to culture, um, the culture of the company, because yeah. some, some companies, um, you know, you, you would think it would be everywhere. You would think everyone would want diversity and everyone would want diversity of ideas, but believe it or not. Yeah, I don't know. But that's true, that's absolutely true. I actually had a question that kind of uh, sprung from that. Like how, because you work with many different companies and startups, how are you able to determine, to determine if this company is good at those things? If this company is a good fit for culture, um, and, w and what their culture is like if you get like a, an interview or two. Mm -hmm. Like how, how do you determine that? Um, I don't know, even especially at, like in, in my last field as a yeah. woman, like I was put down a lot. I mean, it was a very hostile environment for women. Yeah. And so Where it's like you, I what, want to what personally. What industry? I was in the financial industry oh, before. Boy. Yeah, mm -hmm. very interesting, very different. Um, so uh, that's one of my personal yeah. goals, fears, whatever, is that I want to be able to go into a company that I know will be a good fit for me culturally as, as a human being, not yeah. just one aspect of my person? Yeah, this is a good question, and I believe I just came up with the answer within the past 24 hours because I've been thinking about it a lot. I'm the type who learns really slowly, um, and by hard knocks. <laughs> but actually, we were talking about, and my friend and I were talking about um, how, do you, how do we teach people about red flags before you get in? And my personal method will be, um, I, I think this might work, is to actually not be afraid to ask to spend more time with the team. Mm -hmm. Not just one lunch, not just a couple of interviews, but actually like go hang out. Because you can't hide bad culture at the end of the day. Yeah. Good idea. That's a good idea. Good idea. Thanks. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I'm aware it seems that uh, part of uh, your uh, your maintaining your viability in the business is, is that you want to keep uh, abreast of uh, what's new yeah. and uh, and and it seems like the best way to do that is to uh, ad identify and interact with thought leaders you know yeah. because this this industry is all about innovation and and some creative people yeah. just within between their ears have the power to really change the landscape. And so I'm curious to know about uh, pe thought leaders you've come across, maybe people we should follow on Twitter or some interesting ideas that you perceive to be up and coming. Thank you for asking. I have been very lucky to have met some great people in the industry. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Martin Casado. Um, he is M A R T I N underscore Casado. He is known as the father of SDN. Ooh. Yeah, SDN is software defined networking. Now, I will also attribute a couple of people who are not on Twitter who are like grumbling, which is who would be. Oh can't remember you guys right now. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, exactly. They're not on Twitter. So Martin Casado, you know, he was at Stanford. He actually, the story on him, he and no one does it alone, right? But built Nasira or, you know, raised Nasira. Nasira w was bought by VMware, right? So he is one of those winner stories. But I mean, there was a day where he was in a little lab in Stanford, okay? So forget all the money part, forget the bit, you know, forget that stuff and go to nerdy science part because that's what really matters to me. And, you know, he started SDM, which is a huge freaking thing. So he's cool. Um, Sarah Novotny on Twitter, she is S A R A H N O V O T N Y, and you guys, it, it, everyone, you ladies and gents may ping me at any time to get these people. But um, she is very well known in the Kubernetes com community, um, been around, smart, smart human being, um, and I respect her. Um,
there's a lot of people out there. Um, as far as communities, Kubernetes, I think, is like where it's at, the Docker community, Docker and container communities. Um, you know who you might want to follow also is Joe Beda, J-B-E-D-A. His wife is a doctor, um, a health doctor, I forget what she's a what her specialty is, but he's really big into culture. He just started his own company called Heptio. He, he and his buddy, um, colleague, uh, Craig McClucky were from Google. Help, they started Kubernetes and now they started their own company. But why I give him a shout out is not for company reason. It's because I've actually engaged with him and he's really, he gets it about people. Um, and then the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation seems like something interesting. Yeah, and then um, Hyperledger might be cool. I know that's new and I don't know what that's about. Oh, you know who would be cool? And one, this is the last one I'll say. Dan Cohn, because he the, he's the executive director of the Cloud Native Commu Computing Foundation. And it's Dan, K-O-H-N-1. And I recommend any of these people that you feel welcome to tweet them and ask them questions. Because that's what they really need is people at this level, you know, saying like, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're, you know, and you know what? They're hiring people like me to go like, hey, where are you? What are you talking about? So. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah uh, go for it. My question is going to be a little bit of a change of pace uh, if you wanted to continue. But I, I just wanted to ask you, um, about your entrepreneurial journey. You, you said you started working with Samsung, yep. uh, one of the biggest tech companies in the world. Um, How'd you go from there to wanting to kind of start your own company? Good cue. Um, I'm just gonna party hop in my head around that one. So Samsung, um, I don't know if this is a plus or minus about me. What's your name? Danton. Danton, uh, thanks for the question. Oh, you did? <laughs> I, I worked in uh, HQ in Korea. Oh, wow. Whoa. So okay. I, I don't know what it's be... like at the subsidiary level. Yeah. Um, I just know what it's like in Korea, and it's a little bit different, I think. Yeah, I know. You're royalty. Well, actually, um, yeah, that's off, off camera combo. But I, I actually was the first new grad hire on the Apple team. And now, you know, at that time, Apple and Samsung had that love hate thingy so um and it was it was a secret team with a secret name so it was really cool i did market research analytics um and it was very cool because like everyone was korean and it was like oh that was probably inappropriate for me to say but it was it was like you know like i fit in as far as like working hard and getting ahead went but it was also a little bit rough. You didn't ask me all this this is too much so so i was at samsung and i was there five months and I chose to leave because I like to move and make results quickly in a way that makes sense to me. Kamsahapnida. Kamsahapnida, thank you, Samsung. <laughs> but, um, right, and so I, they were very cool to me and very nice to me, but I wanted to move quicker. So I went to a startup. And I went to a startup where quickly you won't see it on my LinkedIn, so you can't figure out who it is. But quickly, I could tell. I was like, I asked my boss, who's still my friend, and she works in the industry. I said, how are we going to make money here? Like, what is this thing? <laughs> you know? And she, she wasn't from the startup world, but I, in one of my past lives, I was an executive assistant in the startup world. So I knew quickly that there was, we were selling air, right? And like... She was just like, she was like, I don't know, but she kind of, she's not as passionate as I am about it, so she kind of didn't care as long as she's getting her paycheck and having some fun and learning or whatever. So, so I was like, how are we doing this? And, and sure enough, like at the end of the day, the company just wasn't flying. So then, you know, I had one of those stalls where you go like, holy crap, what do I do? And that's probably where my own little, that's not when it's the community started. Then I ended up at, I went to NetApp for three months. Um, and goodness gracious, I, I left because it wasn't a good fit for me. Um, I was a consultant there. I wasn't on board full time. 
Um, but it was cool, but it, it just wasn't a good fit. And then I found SDN Central on Craigslist of all places. And I swear to God that there will be a book coming from my life because there is no way that me finding it on Craigslist is not the best detail in the world. <laughs> And, and it was great, man. It was like two entrepreneurial like partners, Matt Palmer and Roy Chua. And Roy Chua went to MIT, so I was like, oh, it's Iron Man, you know. And um, I know, I know, I was so naive and young. And he's, he's cool, but I mean, he's not Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Roy. But anyway, so yeah, so I built this freaking company. I love this joint because super small, a few journalists, and then there's me. I have a really wide skill set, and I go in like a rototiller, and I'm kind of hardcore, and I know how to do things well and do things right when it comes to marketing, and I'm kind of tireless. Not anymore, which is really nuts, it sucks, but I, I, I try pretend, I pretend I'm tireless. And, but back then I really was, and yeah, and so I built the startup with them, and I was really nailing it, and I met a bunch of people in the industry, so I didn't really know the value then of that, but as you'll come to know, like, you, you do want to, you know, network. And um, I worked there, and then a year and three months later, um, that came to an end. And uh, like I told you earlier, I forget where I worked last week, but, um, and then along the way, and then I took on clients. That's when I started going like, okay, I, I got to have my own shtick. Because you can't sit around on the floor not getting paid, right? So, so I started just hustling. Really, it became a hustle. And I just said, OK, I have my own thing. And start going out, you know, talking to people and saying, this is what I do. And um, oh, from my time at SDN Central, I had, had, I had worked with a company, Nuage Networks, owned by Nokia, a multi-billion dollar company. And don't forget that as you're coming up, don't forget to value the value of your company, right? Like you, you don't think you're important because you see all this big stuff, but really you're helping make a multi-billion dollar company successful. So, that, so you're worth that, <laughs> right? And so I was there. Uh, for a year. It was amazing. I went to OpenStack Paris. It was really cool. I met a great team of developers. I helped them do their developer, developer marketing. Worked in virtualization. Very cool stuff. That came to an end. Nuage Networks. I was like, it's the community. Here we go. I asked ON, I talked to OnLab. ON Lab. It has, um, its rootstock is Princeton, Stanford, and Cal. You should look it up. It's a good company. They make open networking operating system. And CORD, Central Office uh, Regional Data Center, something like that. Anyways, so they hired me to do a community survey, and it was fantastic. I spoke with like C-level um, people, VP-level, and then academics from all over the world, all over the world, and did a community survey. And then I was offered a job by Walmart Labs, and I took that. And then that, we have, we have uh, parted ways, and here I am. <laughs> huh. What a journey, right? Yeah, and I suppose, I think uh, I, I'm going to be looking for help with any questions, any questions anyone has, but think about that uh, just for, for now. Um, you mentioned Kubernetes, and my uh, understanding is that it's um, a tool for large-scale deployment of containers. I, am I right? Am I close? Who knows about Kubernetes here? Oh, nice. Well, I am going to give uh, a shout out then to, well, let's see what it says. Open source production grade container orchestration management. Now, this is where your social media person matters. Like, does that really describe them? You tell me. Oh, I think that I was think just you synonymous it. with what I said. Yeah, except you mentioned enterprise grade, didn't you? Or big, oh, large, large scale. 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 Um, Kelsey Hightower, are you familiar with him? Oh, okay, you should know him. I just assume everyone knows him. So his name is um, Kelsey Hightower. He's K-E-L-S-E-Y-H-I-G-H-T-O-W-E-R. He is the Kubernetes 
monster, you know, he is the, mo the, the beautiful monster of Kubernetes, and he also loves to share his knowledge. He's one of those. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I am not a Kubernetes expert, so I don't want to pin it down to that, but it sounds right to me. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, let's see. So, uh, we're getting to the tail end of the hour, but I do want to open the floor to questions. Uh, I have a question. If anyone else has one, you can just uh, tap us on the shoulder. Um, I want to kind of backtrack to the talk about open source. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering um, if, if, if you know this, I'm just perplexed. How, how does a company that gives their software make money, a company that just lets anyone have it, let, how, how are they making money? And then also, did when, when you were interacting with companies, were you working with engineers, software engineers? And if you were, how, what was that like? Like a little bit more in detail. Yeah. For starters, the, the boilerplate answer, I believe, is support. The su you have to pay for support. Oh. So especially on an enterprise company, oh. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, right? Isn't that interesting? And yes, I work very closely with developers. That is what I work with. And um, uh, using JIRA, compound boards, whatever project um, I'm working on, you know, if it involves that. Um, you know, recently I've had an experience where a developer asked me about getting training, and I drove that all the way up the stack to the leadership who could decide if we could purchase whatever he was wanting. So that's the kind of things I do with developers. Um, I also inspire developers to write. I usually end up doing a technical blog or something like that um, and managing editorial stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're so good and important. Let me know if you need any help. And I mean, free of charge, you know what I mean? Thank yeah. Thank you. Unless I'm on a tent in the street, then it's, then it's not free of charge. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. So um, I'm curious as to, uh, so like I, so the Mary Barra, who's the CEO of GM, okay. she graduated from my university and I think it oh. uh, highlights, you know, the, uh, Opportunity for, for women to yeah. you know, ri rise up to these high positions that are mainly dominated by males. And yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what that journey is. I mean, it's hard to like, it, may, it might be hard to like um, think about that since uh, it might be a unique situation, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that in terms of how they got to that position in that journey. That's a great question. Thank you. What's your name? Um, my name's Hunter. Hunter. And I like your shirt, your shirt. And I actually got up at six to watch the dragon go up two nights, two mornings in a row, right? And at the end of the second one, the young lady, um, I forget her name, I'm following her on Twitter now, the, the anchor, well, they had two men and an, three men, young men, and then the young woman anchor, but she's an engineer full on. She was like, we are looking for a full stack engineer, so I know. Uh, he used to work at Tesla. Oh, you did? Yeah. Cool. How was it? You look, you look like you're so well, no bruises, no yeah, scares. Yeah, long hours. Uh, yeah. I mean, kind of on a side note, it was cool. I actually got to see Elon Musk, and he signed, I, he signed my, one of my rockets. Oh, my gosh. You build rockets or what? Yeah, for fun. Oh, that's awesome. Now, do you follow um, <laughs> for, <laughs> for fun? I, I really, do you have one here? No, it's not it's mine. Are you on Twitter? Yeah. Cool. I mean, I'd love to like connect with you on Twitter and everyone here on LinkedIn and Twitter. But you know, he has the bored Elon Musk Twitter handle. Do you know this? <laughs> it's it's literally called bored Elon Musk, and he just he comes up with ridiculous stuff. So the other morning, when I'm on caffeine, sometimes I have genius versus stupid ideas. <laughs> so I made bored Patricia Dugan. You can check it out. I've had five ideas so far. But anyway, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I have thoughts on that. My current feeling, um, and by the way, I'm always thinking and always iterating, and so sometimes my feelings just will change per, per week, per moment. But my feeling is this. 
at the level I'm at, I think the next step is a mentor, a powerful, uh, I don't like the word powerful, a mentor who has already excelled, willing to not just show you the ropes, but kind of help you get there. Because I have noticed and observed um, that I think there's a certain level you get to where it's hard work and luck and being scrappy and you know whatever. And then there's a level that I think actually comes from someone saying like, I see this in you and you're not gonna, you know, I see this in you and, and let me help you get there. That's what I think. And, and yeah, and I actually am going to ask someone soon if she'll mentor me, because I met someone recently and it seems that energy and she's been, she's, she's a, prof a professor at a huge um, university and I've observed these women uh, on, on Twitter and stuff or you know, like these women you talk about and I go like, I see that glimmer in their eyes that I have, I see that. And I, I don't go for things for, for um, what's the word, for money or title, although you know, you do kind of sometimes go like, okay, I really, you know, don't want to share like a apartment when I'm 50. No, no offense, you know, but I'm just saying like, um, you know, at a certain point you do want a little bit more money and you do want comfort, but there's something, people that go that way, it's because they're hungry to do things. Yeah. Did I answer that? Sure. Kind of, sort of. I think so. I think yeah. you did. And um, unless there's any other questions, we may have one more time, but... Um, Okay, so it's probably about time to wrap it up. Before we formally thank you, I was just wondering, are you going to be able to stay after at all just to sure. talk to him? Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So uh, let's formally thank Patricia. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.